Welcome to the New City Church Podcast. My name is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and we're thrilled that you've joined us for this week's message. Every week at New City, we invite people to experience new life through trusting Jesus, learn a new way of honoring God, and walk in a new purpose of making disciples. If you're looking for more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. This is, uh, this is shopping season, and so we're going to, um, we're going to need to go through a few things there. Uh, when it comes to uh, online shopping, many of you guys know that there's a few things that can happen that can go wrong. Uh, You've got to read reviews very carefully, okay? Read the reviews very carefully because you never know what you're going to get. This is a great thing right here. This, uh, this really nice, beautiful pillow on, uh, on Amazon. Look at that. Uh, it's like a dinosaur pillow, and you can buy it, design, a dinosaur pillowcase. And you order that, but this is what the person who got it, this is what they actually got, which is a dinosaur pillowcase with the child that was actually in the promo photo on it. So it's almost like we don't even need to have a kid for this. This is just a beautiful moment, right? So <laughs> weren't expecting that, right? Um, this is one of my favorites just because it's just a little bit off. There's just something that's so off about this guy. It's like they thought they were getting a great teddy bear, great big teddy bear, but it's just not okay. The proportions of the legs just are too human, <laughs> which just makes it always suspect. And then just, there's another one that I thought that was great. This one I've seen before. This is probably classic. You've probably seen this. You know, you need some chairs. You need some, something cheap. Maybe put that in the, you know, in the kids' room or wherever else. Just a plastic chair. And so this is what they got. Um, you always got to check the sizes of it, actually. It's, it's, actually, <laughs> it's actually this big. So uh, that was great, you know. And so, you know, you, you return that. You, put, you send that back, right? I'm going to invite you to stand because we're going to read um, a little bit of our text today. And and the idea being here today that, man, things are not always as they uh, are reviewed to be, okay? Um, We're going to look to Luke chapter 2. It says, in, in, uh, in those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee to the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the family of David. He went in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to a firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I was, uh, I want to kind of title this quick brief message today, The Reviews Are In, Um, because when I was thinking about the songs that our kids were singing today, they kind of kept coming back around to this, oh, what a glorious night idea. And when we read this here and we put ourselves into this situation and into the text that we have, um, we, might really, we might really question whether that's the final review that would come in. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray and I'll have you be seated again. Lord, thank you today for your word. Thank you for speaking to us again in a fresh way. Your word is a lamp for our feet, is a light for our path. And Lord, even though we may be familiar with the Christmas story, God, we thank you that it's your, the unfolding of your word that gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. And so today we pray that, Lord, you would speak to us in a fresh way because your word is living and active. And so, God, would you do that? And would, it, would we be able to respond, I pray, with faith and obedience? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. When we zoom into the story... And we get the reviews from that night. We might have heard something different because let me recap for you what happened. From Rome, uh, 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 in, in, you know, an impossible distance away for this family, there goes out a decree that shifts the entire empire. 
right? The whole empire gets set in motion, and this decree reaches all the way to this backwater town called Nazareth. And there in Nazareth is living a young couple who are engaged to be married, but they're in crisis at this moment because the, the, the young lady is pregnant before the wedding day. So there is a, a, a scandal in the community, if you will, um, and they're in crisis at this moment, and then word comes that they have to leave Nazareth and go on a journey to the hometown of the, the young man who is named Joseph. They have to, if, if it isn't enough to manage this crisis, they have to make this long journey to his family ancestral home just so they can pay a tax. All right. It's not like they're going for a great Christmas party, family reunion or anything else like that. It's you need to go here so you can pay a new tax. So they're facing the embarrassment and the judgment from family and friends, who knows, for a baby that they weren't trying for or planning for. They have to pay a bill that they weren't expecting. They have a long walk. It's somewhere around 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem in, in kind of dusty, sun-scorched daytime and then freezing desert nights. They have to all the while and all the way avoid robbers and thieves and wild animals. These are, these, this, these, are, these are roads that were there, but they weren't safe. She's nine months pregnant on a donkey <laughs> for days at a time, no padded seats, with a man who not too long ago had considered leaving her. <laughs> so I want you to put it all together. It was a quiet trip. To Bethlehem. You know what I'm talking about. If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're married, if you're, if you're one of the husbands in the room, we know about when it's time to just be quiet, put your head down, just do what we're doing right now, because if I bring anything up, if I try and make it better, it ain't going to get any better. I think there was a quiet trip. When they arrived, I want you to see this, the text says when they arrived and she was about ready to give birth, there was no room available. And so she's looking at him going, you didn't even think to make a reservation? <laughs> and so <laughs> instead of having a place to stay and the price for rooms having gone so far up, probably because demand all over the empire was, was probably high as people were going to their ancestral homes having to pay this tax, right? The innkeeper turning them away thinking, I don't know if, these if this couple is going to be able to pay. I can probably find a better customer than them. Way too much trouble probably to have this woman who's obviously ready to give birth. Mary at that moment is thinking to herself, remembering just nine months earlier when the angel had appeared to her and said, Hail Mary, full of grace. And she's thinking, Hail Mary, hail no. I would give this blessing zero out of ten, <laughs> right? Some of you guys, I like that guy. He's so edgy, right? He's so edgy. And others of you are like, heard that joke before, Steve. Check, did that one this Christmas season. Got it. I know you guys. I, I see, I see, I see where, the, where it's registering. At this point in the story, as we're getting to this moment where they've made this long journey, she's been carrying this child for nine months. I mean, the, 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 the discomfort, the inconvenience upon inconvenience that's going on right here, the, 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 the shame, really, that they have kind of had to endure, I'm sure. Um, at this point, this is not looking like a blessing, and it's not feeling like a blessing. It's just a mess. It's just a debacle, <laughs> right? And I think it's really important that we look at that right now because when we sing the Christmas carols and when we do the Christmas productions and when we, you know, go through the Christmas traditions, I think it appropriately evokes a lot of nostalgia and a lot of warm feelings in us. But when we get into the text and we look at this, we have to admit that they didn't have the same kind of hindsight bias that we do. <laughs> They didn't have the same kind of understanding of what all was about to happen and how this was all going to take place and how it was all going to work out. And so there was a tremendous amount of discomfort involved. And really, if you were to ask them to review it mid-text, I'm sure that would not be a strong review. This whole Christmas blessing, I don't really know about it. <laughs> Paul, when he writes to the Romans, I want to just kind of just bring this in when he's writing to the to the Roman church years later now decades later he's writing to the, the believers in Rome and he writes this 
kind of like what we would maybe call his magnum opus. Romans 16 chapters, this long letter that outlines the gospel. And, and I, I think in probably the richest fashion, Paul really kind of breaks down for the believers there what it is that God has accomplished through Christ. And for seven chapters, when you read the book of Romans, when you read this long letter, for seven chapter divisions, he is literally going through the history of how humankind went off the rails from the beginning. God showed his goodness to humankind, but they refused to give thanks to him and to acknowledge him as God. And with that refusal to give thanks to the giver of life and with that unchecked desire to become God, to, to, to put ourselves in God's place, everything went off the rails. And it was the root of, of the sinful condition of humankind. So Paul is outlining this, and he says, basically, he begins to kind of lay out the narrative after that breakdown of, of, of what was supposed to be good and beautiful. Paul says, then God still had a plan and a purpose to rescue human, humankind. His love meant he would not let us go. And so then from chapters 3, kind of bas- basically around chapters 3 on to 6, he shows how God began to raise up a people through a man named Abraham and a chosen family who were going to be a family of promise. They were going to carry basically... They were going to be the bearers of God's rescue mission to the world. But those people, Paul says, instead of being a solution, turned out to be a part of the problem too. That's where he goes. He says, he says so, so this people who were supposed to embody God's goodness and his faithfulness and his wise leadership and his salvation to the world, they ended up also being broken just like the rest of us. And so what is God going to do? Well, then he says he sends the law through Moses. And then he says, but the law, which was good, unfortunately, didn't actually change who we are. It just clarified how bad we are. <laughs> right? So you can see, as Paul is going through this narrative, the story is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. The law couldn't save. Instead, Paul says, it just made me utterly sinful. <laughs> and then by the time he gets to chapter 7, it's like things are, things are it's, uh, it's almost like a, a feeling of like almost like hopelessness. What in the world? How are we ever going to? And Paul says, hey, even in myself, he says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. Even when I want to do what's right, my flesh kind of hijacks that desire and I end up doing wrong. When I want to be generous, so let's just say this, when I want to be generous, it's like my sinful nature steps in and says, yes, give it to them, but do it so they'll give you something back. It's like I can't do anything good without my sinful nature stepping in, he says, and and messing it all up so that nothing that I do is good before God. And he says, he he ends it all with this at the end of chapter 7. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I mean, think of where he's at with this right now. This whole rescue mission, he says, this whole plan of God to bring life and to reflect his beauty and his goodness and to create community that would reflect the the kind of community that God has had has experienced since eternity past. He says, "I, I don't know about the reviews on this thing. Wretched. I mean, it just like translators really struggle with this. Oh, miserable man that I am. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who is going to deliver me from this body of death? He says, the reviews are in. I am miserable. I am twisted. I am wretched. Even my good deeds are shot through with selfishness. Even my best efforts fall incredibly short of pleasing God or of redeeming me. Here's the great news. I think there's some people, maybe as I'm talking like this, not everybody, but there are a few of you in here who are like, now we're, that's real talk right there. Now we're really talking because you feel that. <laughs> and when, when, when you say, oh, wretched man that I am, there are some people who, who, are, who are saying, I, I get that. I like that. I, I, hear what, I hear what that is because you live that. And, and I just say this, like that, this is where we hit rock bottom in the book of Romans. But then 
It's so interesting. The next line that he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then after chapter seven, we get what is basically like the, the pinnacle of all of Paul's letters. Romans chapter eight, you will not find a more, a more beautiful exposition of the hope and the glory of the gospel and God's saving work in our lives. You won't find any more uh, eloquent, you know, kind of um, uh, a picture that he paints of what God is doing in you and me. So that he finally gets to the end of, of chapter eight and he says, talking about all this stuff that we have to deal with and the hardships and the, and the difficulties and the failures. And he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. So I love it. My, my, uh, my friend and mentor, Pastor Tim Delina, he says, it, he says it like this. How do you go? I think he said it like this. Maybe I'm putting words in his mouth. How do you go from miserable to more than conquerors? And the answer is you have to look at how things end. You have to, you have to keep in mind that there's still an ending to this thing. God is not finished. So when we feel lost or hopeless when we're hurt or when we've been done wrong, when we've been betrayed, when we've been left behind, when we've been misjudged, when we see the casket lowered into the grave and it seems like death itself is closing in around us, we have to remember God is not finished yet. That is not the end. Even though at that moment, if we were to give it a review, we'd say, man, I'd give this a one out of ten. It was good for a minute, but then it just all fell apart. I'd give this thing, I'd give this life a two out of ten. We had a little, a few bright spots, but in the end, man, what a wretched man I am. How miserable I am. And if we review it at that moment, then we miss it. God is not finished. So here is what I, I love this. This is why I chose this. Because, and you say, well, how are you, how are you trying to bring in Romans chapter 8 into the Christmas story? Let me just, there's just one word that matters in this. Romans 8. All around us, we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is stirring us within, and we're also feeling the birth pangs. These barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. So when we in our hearts say, oh, wretched man that I am, that's you and I coming to full term. That's why I think this is the beauty of if you're at that point in your life where you say, I see it, I feel it, man, what a wretched man I am. You know what you are? You're coming to full term. <laughs> Because God is about to do something beautiful in your life because you're beginning to see things as they really are. And then he says, that's why the waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what it, what it is that's enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. And so here we have Mary in the midst of this incredible discomfort, in the midst of the shame, disappointment, all the things that were unplanned, the uncertainties, all of it there. And as she's waiting, she's getting larger. And as she's getting larger, she's getting closer to the moment when the hope and the joy of the world is going to be born. It's moving towards something. Paul says the waiting doesn't wreck us. It builds us. The suffering doesn't diminish us. It enriches us because there's an ending. There's an ending that is about to recast all of our opinions about the beginnings. When they left you, it didn't end you. It enlarged you. When they talked about you, it didn't end you, it enlarged you. Now, yeah, sure, I, it could sound like I'm just trying to make, you know, kind of get people pumped up and say it's going to be okay, but how many say when you left them, it didn't have to end you? That's just a sign that there's more to come. When they hated you, it didn't, it didn't produce hate in you. I want you to see that. It doesn't have to produce hate in you. 
When they talked about you, it doesn't have to destroy you. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, here's his words. He said, mark this, in the last days there will be terrible times. He says people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. In the last days, that's what's going to happen. He says, but hang on because that's your sign that something is is about to be born. And so he gives us the ultimate review. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 18. This is what I want to end on here. It says 118. I just noticed in my notes it's just a typo. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's it. Paul says, hey, I got a review for you. He gets all the way through one, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and he gets to chapter 8, and he says, you know what? I told you that, all, that awful story that ends with, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he gets in there. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let me give you the review now on what God has done through Jesus. I, I consider that these present sufferings do not compare to the glory that is going to be revealed in Jesus. Amen? The end is going to change the way we see the whole thing. That's what, the end changed. When that baby was born for that family in Bethlehem, it changed the whole thing. They had a healthy baby boy promised by the angel that there was there the fulfillment of something impossible, miraculous that took place. And the end of that whole journey changed the way they viewed the rest of it. So we can sing, what a glorious night. We don't sing, oh, it's such a terrible night. They were, they were left outside by the innkeeper. You know, she was uncomfortable and he was really feeling bad. You know, like it was not, we don't sing so. We say, oh, what a glorious night because of the way that it ended. So Frederick Beekner says this. He says, what's lost is nothing next to what's found. And all the death that ever was set next to life will scarcely fill a cup. He says, when the end of this whole thing gets seen, oh, all of the trials, all of the disappointments, all of the losses, all of it, you guys are going to look at it and say, it's nothing. I consider that the sufferings of this present world are nothing compared to the glory that is going to be revealed in us because when he is finished with his work in us, you and I are going to change the reviews. It's going to be 10 out of 10. <laughs> Phenomenal. <laughs> Can't believe it. Would do it again if I could. <laughs> it's going to be amazing because of the way that it ends. Jesus, the Bible tells us, was born in humility. He lived a life of poverty. He taught with grace toward all. He received sinners to himself. He brought hope to the hopeless. He welcomed the outcast. But he was falsely accused. He was unjustly tried. He was condemned to death. And he died in humiliation and disgrace. And honestly, if you were to put the review in at that moment, you would say, what a failure. What did he do? What did that accomplish? But that isn't the end of the story. <laughs> because though he suffered and though he died in disgrace, the Bible says that God raised him up in glory and he is seated at the right hand of God today. It's not how it ended. It ends with a soon coming Savior who's going to set to right everything that is wrong in our world, who's going to judge the living and the dead, and who's going to bring his just reward with him. So how it ends really matters. And that's what I really want to get across today. What a glorious night. Yep, it certainly was because of how it ended. And I want to challenge you today 
you and I have a decision how this goes with our life. How, how, where is our life headed? When I was 15 years old, I was confronted with that. I'll tell you what, man, when I was 15 years old, you say, that kid's too young to make a decision that's going to affect. That kid, you know, it wasn't. The Spirit of God can speak to you today. Whether you are a young person, whether you are an old person, and will, and will speak to you and say, listen, you have a choice in how this ends. Because though this greatest gift that the world has ever known was brought to us on that Christmas night, though it came wrapped in a humble package for you, for, you know, with skin and bones in a way that you and I could, could, could kind of grasp and get, our, get our, our minds around, though that gift has been given to us, it still needs to be received. It still needs to be received. And the Bible says the way that we do that is, is, is we like to say, it's as simple as A, B, C. We receive this gift of God by admitting that we are sinners. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Paul said in Romans. He says that the free gift of God is salvation. Right? So if we will admit, that's A, if we will B, believe that this gift was offered for you and me so that we could have redemption, rescue from our sin. <laughs> The wretched person that I am, let me tell you, you could say, oh, well, he's not such a bad guy. No, I really am. I heard one, I heard one pastor say this this week. It was great. He said, if, if, I, if I were to know what you thought of, what just went through your mind during this week, you wouldn't be allowed in church. And if you were to know what went through my mind this week, you wouldn't come. <laughs> Oh, wretched man. Oh, wretched man that I am. Let me, I'm just telling you, when, when you believe that what Jesus did was the pinnacle, it was the finish line of what God wanted to do to rescue you and me, and we believe that, then all that's left to do is to confess. That's the way we receive it. We say, Jesus, I believe. I admit that I'm a sinner, and I believe that you died for me. You see, how this thing end, ends really matters. So I'm going to invite everybody to bow your heads with me for just a moment. I'm going to ask just very plainly today, you say, I'm not confident about the way that this thing is going to end for me. And I want to leave this place today, this Christmas season, I want to leave with confidence knowing that I have received God's grace and forgiveness and the gift of new life that he gave to the world through his son Jesus. If that's you and you say, I want to be confident, I'm not sure, but I want to be sure when I leave today. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. We're going to pray together before, before we all go out today and, and, and celebrate and do all this stuff. Just right where you are, just raise your hand. Hold it up high so I can see. Thank you. Praise God. Anybody else, just hold it up high. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to go through. I'm going to go through and just count for just a minute. And if you're here, you say, I, that's me. I want to leave with confidence. I want to receive this grace, this gift of God's forgiveness today. I'm just going to just hold it up real high so I can see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now up in the balcony. Is there anybody up in the balcony? Let's see. Raise your hand if that's you. Eight. Praise the Lord. I'm going to invite everybody to repeat after me. Just right now, just this simple prayer to receive this grace. Say, say this. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you were the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt. You died for it there. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to. But you rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be made new. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Everybody look up here. I'm going to have you stand in just a minute, but I want you to look up here. This is why we do what we do as a church. It is never going to be a burden. It is never going to be a waste of time to give an opportunity for a lost son or daughter of God to come home. It is never 
going to be outside of the parameters of what we do. And so I'm saying it is the moment. The Bible says when somebody comes back to Jesus, and I'm just telling you this, we see people come to Jesus, and I mean it. You say, well, are those hands real? Is that really happening? I know the stories. It's happening. And here's what I need. I need some of you who have walked with the Lord for years and who are sitting back on the sidelines. I need you to get up and say, I will help somebody who is new in Christ to walk with Jesus. I, so that's what I need you to do. And I'm saying that today. I'm saying that as a pastor today because we're not here to put on Christmas performances. Oh, it's beautiful to have our kids do it. I'm saying we're not here to have a production. This is not me giving a sermon performance. This is me urging you because I believe in the truth of what the gospel says about you and me. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, you and I can be saved. I believe that, and when those eight people raise their hand today, oh man, I rejoice along with all of heaven. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you stand as God's people, and I'm going to have you rejoice together in the grace and the goodness of God that he would save sinners like you and me. Praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. New City Church, we had.